Welcome to the program. It's 50 days today since Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the start of the war there. And Ukraine is claiming to have carried out a missile attack on the flagship of Russia's Black Sea fleet, setting it on fire. The Russians admit the Moskva has been badly damaged, but they say it was because ammunition on board exploded. Quoting the Russian Defense Ministry, Interfax says the crew of around 500 had all been evacuated and the cause of the fire being investigated. But a Ukrainian official has said the ship had been hit by two missiles. However, this has not been confirmed. The Moskva is the pride of the Russian naval fleet in the Black Sea. Russia's activities there are crucial to supporting land operations in the south of Ukraine, where Russia is battling to seize full control of the port of Mariupol. There are very different narratives in Russia and Ukraine about what happened with the Moskva cruiser. Well, I'm joined now by our Moscow correspondent, Jenny Hill, and our correspondent in Kiev, Anna Foster. Let's go to uh, Moscow first. And uh, uh, Jenny, just tell us uh, what the Kremlin is now saying. Yeah, we've had an update. They say that the fire on board the Moskva is now under control. There are no more explosions, they say. Uh, you're right, they admit that the vessel has been significantly damaged, although they have said that the major missiles on board have not been damaged. They plan to tow the vessel back to port while they continue their investigations because they say they still haven't established the cause of the fire. Certainly no confirmation um, that, as the Ukrainians suggest, that this was some kind of missile missile strike. What's the sense of, of, of how significant this, this warship is for the Russians? Well, in military terms, um, analysts suggest that actually its loss from the area might not be too significant. It was part of the blockade um, of the Black Sea, the Ukrainian coast there, which meant that maritime trade, travel, in effect, um, couldn't get through. Ukraine cut off there uh, by the blockade, and also that it was perhaps providing anti-aircraft cover for Russian troops on the ground. The real significant loss of the ship in that area, though, is perhaps more of a symbolic one. This is the pride of the Black Sea fleet. Um, and if it is proven that it has been lost through a, a Ukrainian missile strike, um, one can imagine this could have a pretty damaging effect on, on Russian morale. Yeah, we're, we're just looking at some of the pictures in from the Russian Defense Ministry uh, of, of that vessel. Uh, and Jenny, no doubt, I mean, you've been telling us this for weeks, uh, the, the state TV really does continue to parrot uh, the Kremlin's line on this. I imagine uh, they, they would be, uh, you know, continuing whatever the Kremlin is saying about this. Yeah, um, as far as Russians who only get their information from state media are concerned, um, you know, this special military operation, as they call it here, not a war, is going entirely according to plan. And I wasn't surprised to see this morning um, that state TV headlines weren't talking about the, um, the, the Moscow, what had happened to it. Um, and I expect that the authorities will continue to, to play that down, certainly for, for the time being. I should also bring you up to date on one other development we've seen here. Last night, the um, Moscow, said that it would bomb command centers in Kyiv and other parts of Ukraine if Ukrainians don't stop strikes on Russian territory. We're talking about the border areas between the two countries. Um, and just this morning, officials, Russian officials, say that there has been a strike on a border crossing um, and that a residential area has been hit. Uh, we haven't had a direct response to that from Moscow, but of course this is potentially, and it's only potentially at this stage, uh, a significant escalation. Jenny, thank you so much for that latest update. Let's go now to our uh, Anna Foster, who joins us from uh, Kiev. And Anna, let's just um, uh, go, return back to the, the warship uh, and just what the Ukrainians are now saying. A very different narrative from here in Ukraine to, of course, the one that Jenny just brought you from Russia. As far as the Ukrainian military are concerned, this was a victory for them. This was two of their missiles that were fired at and hit their target. They say that any fire, any damage on board was caused by them. And it is something that they are taking as a significant step forward. Of course, Ukrainian sea power is not what Russian sea power is. These missiles that they're believed to have used are still quite new, actually, to the Ukrainian military. So here it is being viewed very much as a small victory and a symbolic victory as well. This was the warship that became a meme in the early days of this conflict, the warship that was told by 
the uh, inhabitants of Snake Island where to go. And, and when you go around this country, you see that line, that meme repeated in all sorts of places. So I think people here in Ukraine woke up this morning and felt that for them, this was a really positive step forward for their military campaign. Just bring us up to date, uh, Anna, on, on the situation in the port city of Mariupol. Again, we've got two really conflicting narratives about what's going on there. As far as the Russians are concerned, they say that they are in control of Mariupol or, or very close to it. They say that around a thousand Ukrainian forces surrendered to them yesterday. But again, on the Ukrainian side, they dispute that. They say that the fighting is continuing. They say that Ukrainian forces still hold key pieces of infrastructure, places like the Azovstal Iron and Steel Works, which is a really important industrial area in Mariupol. They say that the Ukrainian army is continuing to fight there, is continuing to hold its ground. So again, as we've seen so many times through this conflict, you have these two competing narratives in a place where it is very, very difficult to verify exactly what is happening. Uh, I I indeed. And, and also, um, uh, Anna, uh, we've been talking about humanitarian corridors, um, uh, ways of getting the people uh, from the besieged uh, port city of Mariupol out. Any updates on that? Well, there are these small humanitarian corridors that continue to exist day by day. Mainly, it has to be set out of the east at the moment. I think there are around nine that have been established today. They are on quite a small scale. And as you rightly highlight, Yalda, the big problem, I would say, at the moment is Mariupol. You'll remember we, we talked about uh, efforts that the ICRC, the International Committee of the Red Cross, were making to try and establish a really large-scale humanitarian corridor out of Mariupol because there are possibly around 100,000 civilians still trapped there with no power, food, water, medicines, all of those things perilously low. So efforts have been made to try and at one point bring in a fleet of buses, have people follow in their private cars, but that has proven really, really difficult to establish in a safe way. It feels like the battle for Mariupol is at a crucial stage. Neither side wants to stop fighting, even for long enough to allow civilians to leave. So while these efforts to make humanitarian corridors are continuing, it's really not on the scale that we need to see to stop the ongoing catastrophe in somewhere like Mariupol. Anna, thank you so much uh, for bringing us up to date there on the situation in Mariupol and the various different narratives coming out uh, of this conflict. Well, let's take a look at some of the main features of the Russian warship. Now, the 510-strong crew cruiser is about 190 metres long and can move at a speed of up to 59 kilometres per hour. Its range is 19,000 kilometres, which is the maximum distance from a base that the fuel capacity of a ship will allow it to travel and then return and can carry one helicopter on board. Well, for more on this, I'm joined now by Shashank Joshi, the defence editor at The Economist. Uh, Shashank, thanks very much for joining us. I just want Afternoon. more details from you uh, about this warship, its significance, what this all means. Well, sure. Well, it, first of all, it's symbolic because, of course, the Moskva was, uh, as has been said, the warship that famously confronted Ukrainian defenders on Snake Island at the very first day of this invasion. And the Ukrainian response, which I, I can't repeat here because it in includes profanity, um, became this iconic symbol of Ukrainian resistance. So the riposte to the Moskva is symbolically very important, but it's also militarily very significant because Russia only had four of these types of cruisers in its arsenal. This was the flagship of the Black Sea Fleet, which is headquartered in Crimea, occupied Crimea, which was invaded by Russia and annexed in 2014. And it's not only an offensive platform that was capable of launching caliber cruise missiles onto Ukrainian targets inland, quite, quite, far, quite far inland, but it was also a defensive platform. It was providing an air defense bubble against missiles, against aircraft, over surrounding ships and other parts of the fleet. So the loss of the Moskva is a symbolic blow. It's a huge success for Ukraine, but it's also militarily significant and does change the dynamics of the war at sea. Uh, and, and, and I suppose for, for Moscow, this, this is also, um, uh, you know, it sums up how this conflict has been going for it. It does. You know, there's a sense, uh, first of all, that everyone is surprised that in Ukraine is an independent state six weeks into the invasion when Western officials, Western intelligence agencies, 
sincerely thought this country would fall within days, if not weeks. But I think what we have seen in the last perhaps several weeks now is that this isn't just Ukraine parrying Russian blows. It isn't just Ukraine on the defensive. Ukraine has shown a significant capacity to take the fight to Russia, both in terms of counterattacks on land, pushing the Russians back around Kiev, around Mykolaiv, around other places, but also striking beyond the front lines. And that includes not just naval strikes, because this, is the, this would be the fourth Russian ship they have struck. It would also be strikes in rear areas, including on Russian soil. So the last few weeks have seen numerous attacks on oil depots, ammunition stockpiles, railway lines in the Belgorod region in Western Russia, which is a key staging area. And it shows you Ukraine is taking the fight onto Russian soil in a very effective way in the last few weeks. So, uh, I mean, from a military perspective, would this now be a time for Moscow to rethink its strategy and its way forward? It already has done. Uh, they've abandoned Kiev, which was very much their objective at the beginning of this campaign. They have abandoned the idea of regime change for now. They could come back to it if they meet with some success. And they are focusing pretty much all their efforts on Donbass, this region of eastern Ukraine, as your correspondent mentioned earlier on. And, and the idea is they overstretched themselves, they diluted their forces, and now they will concentrate them in Donbass. Um, but of course, whether they can do that successfully is still open to question, because they have taken a real bruising, a significant proportion, probably about 30% of their battalion tactical groups originally committed to this are no longer combat effective. And I think it's going to take them weeks, probably weeks, to get their force back into a condition where they can mount a serious, sustained, large-scale offensive against Ukraine in Donbass. Hey, Shashank, if we look at this sort of historic um, precedence of something like this and, 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 and why armies sort of end up in this position, is it a series of blunders, missteps, or not quite understanding their terrain? It's, it's a fascinating question. War optimism, the idea that you will be able to succeed on the battlefield quickly, easily, cheaply, and that the opponent will fold fast, is a common feature of uh, military history, not just among autocratic governments that, of course, don't get information up very freely because people are, are afraid of delivering bad news to dictators like Vladimir Putin. But even in democracies, uh, we only have to look at our example in, in the UK, in this country, of the assumptions that we in the United States had about the campaign in Iraq and the ease with which that would go, the sense that we would be out quickly, the fact that there would be no real insurgency. We can look at the ease with which we thought we would force um, the uh, Serbian government to back down in the 1999 Serbian war over Kosovo. Uh, you know, it took much longer than people thought because we underestimated the Serbian will to resist in that circumstance. So this is an absolutely recurrent pattern of war throughout history, I would say. Shashank, really fascinating hearing your analysis and thoughts there. Thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome.